done that looks at how long you stay infected for. And I guess it's also weighing up the balance of things, isn't it? Because uh, people are becoming less infectious over time and people can't sort of stay in forever yeah. or maybe you should to be on the face Yes, that's exactly right. So many of the scientists that I spoke to about this study, they said, yes, it, this is a useful finding, but at the same time, the longer the isolation period goes on, then the, the worse the impacts on you know, people's jobs, people's livelihood, and going to school if they're under 18. So the, you've got to weigh that up. Thanks, Claire. Now, Ebola is a very frightening disease. It causes people to bleed to death, and depending on the type and how early it's diagnosed, in some outbreaks, as many as 90% of people who caught it have died. But that was before the development of some drugs called monoclonal antibodies. And two of these in particular are very effective in fighting the disease. Now, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's just been announced that preparations are being made for a possible outbreak after the death of a 46-year-old woman in the town of Beni. Now, this week, the World Health Organization is calling for support to help countries at risk to have these two drugs ready for any future outbreak. And Dr. Janet Diaz leads the clinical care unit in the WHO's health emergency program. And she told me how they came up with their new guidelines. We assessed the evidence, and then we show that evidence to an expert panel, independent from the WHO, from different parts of the world. And we make a big effort to make sure we have enough uh, clinicians and experts from all the regions, WHO regions of the world, to make sure it's reflective of the global community. And the recommendation is that two particular types of drugs called monoclonal antibodies are used. So how much of a difference can these monoclonal antibodies make? So the difference is, is, is really big, and it really is based on your risk of dying. So if my risk of dying from Ebola is high, around 66%, and I'm given the drug, mm -hmm. that risk drops to about 28%. And that's in a high-risk population. Let's say my risk of dying was a bit lower. With drug treatment, that risk of dying from Ebola drops to about 17%. So this is really a game-changer, a remarkable reduction in mortality. Um, and what we must remember, it's not just one drug kind of therapy. Actually, it's been given within a package of care, which includes optimized supportive care. So does that change this from a disease which was, you know, fatal in the majority of cases to something that for many will be treatable. That, that really changes things, doesn't it? Yeah, no, I think it's a big game changer. Adding this type of drug therapy, monoclonal antibodies, in addition to the other types of care, I think it has to be important that we say that the patients not only need the treatment, but they also need a package of clinical care, which means early diagnosis with optimized supportive care. And yes, this treatment is a game changer because uh, it does save lives. And we got used to the fact that trials were being done in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Well, the, the same was actually happening with Ebola back in 2015, wasn't it? These were trials that were done on the ground in the middle of an outbreak. Yeah, exactly. The Prevail study, I think, was done in uh, three or four countries, um, three of which were in Africa, and then the PROM study, which is the big trial uh, that was done in the Democratic Republic of Congo that was done in the Eastern Congo, North Kivu, was uh, actually a conflict zone, and currently is a conflict zone, and the uh, colleagues were able to conduct a good quality uh, clinical trial to assess efficacy and safety. And I know you've worked in some of the places where Ebola outbreaks have happened. How difficult is it to, to try to help patients? It's a challenge. I think in some of the more complex areas, one is, is to ensure that the community trusts the, the healthcare system and accepts the care early. And I think that's one of the things that we've struggled with is for patients to be diagnosed early because once you get diagnosed, then you can actually get the treatment to save lives. And the WHO has announced that's come in a week where there has been news of a case of Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo. How quickly can medications like these monoclonal antibodies be made available when there is a, a new outbreak? So in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, that is actually the country that executed the COM study. So the National Institute of Biomedical Research uh, locally is, um, you know, really leaders in advancing the clinical trials here for, for Ebola therapeutics, as well as advancing diagnostic testing. So 
They are well placed right now to respond uh, to Ebola out outbreaks in a timely fashion, and uh, they're able to do good diagnostics, uh, genetic sequencing, as well as to deploy uh, treatment teams uh, to the sites where the outbreaks are and to um, both contain the outbreaks, start immediate vaccination, as well as provide these life-saving treatments. And right now, they do have these therapeutics in country uh, to give to patients if there was to be uh, more cases. And what about the other places where there have been cases before, places like Sierra Leone and Guinea? Would, would they have access to these treatments at the moment? So, no, that's one of our biggest priorities that any potential country that's at risk for potentially having an Ebola outbreak does have access to these drugs and these drugs and are equitable and there's a fair pricing for these drugs to make them available. Many other states really look to the WHO for our recommendations because once you have a strong recommendation for use of, of a therapeutic like this, that means they have strong confidence to put this now into their clinical guidelines, into the national policies, and um, these two drugs will be proposed to the WHO essential medication list uh, at the end of the year for evaluation. So there's still a lot of work, I think, to be done for some of these countries to ensure that they get access at the right time uh, to these therapeutics, and WHO is uh, committed to support in, in that work. So overall, are you optimistic that it can become a less frightening disease? Yeah, I think so. I think Ebola now uh, seems like a success story. There's still much work to do, though, because I think we will all acknowledge that the mortality rate is still quite high, right? Yeah, and still far higher than something like COVID. Yeah, right? and it's still higher than what we would like, so there's still room to do better. And what can we do better? I think there would be a multi pronged approach, if I may say that. One is early diagnosis, so if we reduce the fear of the disease, that the community accepts that there is treatment, then people will essentially get care better. So, so that would be a big step forward. Um, if we improve uh, access to rapid diagnostics, you know, we do see some countries uh, like the Democratic Republic of Congo who can do diagnosis quickly with their systems. Um, so we have to make sure that's possible in all countries. And then starting an Ebola clinical care pathway, the simple things, fluid therapy if you're dehydrated, treatment of co-infections if you also have malaria, electrolyte resuscitation if that is needed. So there's this package of care that has to go along with, especially for those patients that have more complications. In addition to the timely administration of one of these monoclonal antibodies, and together, I think we can reduce more mortality. We can do all of those things really well. Janet Diaz and Claire Wilson is still with me. Now, Claire, when I was thinking about Ebola, I was remembering when the top infectious diseases expert in the U.S., Anthony Fauci, hugged a nurse who'd recovered from Ebola and was no longer infectious. And he has just announced that he'll be standing down at 81 from his government position. He's someone who's become really well known, hasn't he? Oh, yes. Um, and even before COVID, he actually was really well known. For all the work he did in helping to combat HIV and direct the medical response. I mean, he's been a lot of time to um, start a new US president. So, um, That's quite something, isn't he it? He has quite a pedigree. Um, and you might remember when COVID was at its peak, um, Dr. Fauci was very vocal about standing up and um, saying that you know, certain treatments that had been speculated would work that they didn't work and quashing conspiracy theories. And it was very deliberate when he put his arm around the nurse who had recovered from Ebola. And he said he wanted to address the stigma surrounding that disease. It was also stigma against physicians and nurses who were taking care of Ebola patients because there was a feeling they might be infected and then come into the community and infect others. So when I walked out and put my arm around Nina Pham, who was my patient, who I took care of, that was a signal not only in the United States but to the rest of the world because that was a clip that went viral throughout the world and that's exactly what I intended to do because I wanted to show the world that I was not afraid of embracing someone who had recovered from Ebola. And I noticed he was even voted People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive in 2020, which is not bad. Oh, well, it must have been 79 or something, man. Not bad, is it? Yes, and he's 81 now, and I think he's said that he's uh, going on to the next phase of his career. So, um... Brilliant, well, isn't it? Yeah, I'll have what he's having. Absolutely. <laughs> now, we heard about the progress of treatment for Ebola, but let's have a look now at monkeypox, a disease which has long been found in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, but which the world is suddenly interested in now that it's spreading elsewhere.